Hello and welcome to GIS for Reducing Risk in the Community. This is our last FIRE webinar for 2017, so we certainly appreciate your attendance. Um, these webinars are part of ESRI's effort to promote the use of GIS by public safety agencies, and we certainly appreciate your interest. Um, just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, please use the chat window to ask any questions. We're going to have three interactive poll questions, so we request that you respond to those because we're trying to get some feedback on what possibly some of your needs are. Uh, the recording will be posted online after the webinar with links to additional resources and the references we use throughout the uh, presentation. And that email will come out after the webinar is uh, completed. So thank you again. And my name is Mike Cox. I'm your fire and EMS industry manager for ESRI. And these webinars are part of um, our effort to build safe communities with GIS. We realize public safety agencies are facing complex threats and challenges every day. So the unpredictable, the events involving social unrest and public health issues, severe weather events, th these create an environment where missions and priorities change daily. And the approaches we used to take just don't work anymore. We can't work in silos and we have to have the interoperability and the communications between agencies to be effective and secure our communities. Modern challenges require a modern approach. Agencies and organizations need to have tools and operational capabilities to adapt to fluid risks and to support a variety of mission requirements. And we have to be able to identify threats and unify operations rapidly to mitigate these events. So through the power of this geospatial technology, we can now adopt a, a smarter, more integrated approach to safety and security. And with the right technology, every community can be become a safe community. So again, my name is Mike Cox, and I'd also I'd like to introduce a co-presenter, Jeff Barani. He's our public safety assistance program operations manager. And if any of you have dealt with any significant responses over the last few years, you've probably run into Jeff in one, one way or another. I can tell you he's a, a personal hero of mine. Um, he helped provide a foundation in Central Virginia, where I'm from, for a response to significant special events and um, really assisted our IMT, our incident management team, with some of our responses to things like our NASCAR events and deployments for vice presidential debate and the uh, Charlottesville riots. So, Jeff, I'll turn it over to you for a second if you want to give a self-introduction. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. You know, th yeah, th thanks for joining. Glad to have um, Mike on board and, and looking forward to sharing with you about the community risk reduction and GIS tools for that today. So as, as Mike mentioned, I lead our public safety assistance program uh, with the disaster response programs uh, a part of. So thanks, Mike. Yes, sir. Glad you're here. Um, so just a little bit about me because I'm, uh, I'm new to the position, actually just 30 days in. But my history is with Henrico County, Virginia, a fire department that's in central Virginia. It's a county of about 330,000. We cover 244 square miles. We um, have 20 fire stations and about 600 personnel and a full service all hazards agency. We provide EMS transport and ALS services. Uh, but I, I tell you or my background primarily because I want you to understand that, that I, was, I was always an operational guy. I was always the operations guy for about 24 of my 27 years. Um, regional hazmat team, we have one of the, or had one of the state Regional teams are covered about 11,000 square miles for hazmat response. I was a technical rescue team leader for a few years, one of the original program managers for the Central Virginia All Hazards Incident Management Team, and I served at various ranks throughout my career, up through field battalion and special operations chief. And then in 2013, I was lucky enough to be promoted to the operations chief's position. And that's when I really started to see the engagement of GIS for response. And that's where I focused initially, but particularly our special events. So I mentioned before we had a NASCAR facility. So twice a year we have an event with 100,000 people at times that we were um, using GIS and using these technologies to manage resources and track our personnel and be able to provide better services to the guests that were on the property. So it was an incredibly powerful demonstration of what the of what the technology can do. Um, and then also was chief of professional services where we used the technology to um, go through our budget process and we were able to display um, incredible information that was able to influence our elected leaders to the point where we um, had a bond referendum where we got two additional fire stations, two additional engine companies, and two additional ambulances. And that was all through the appropriate data analysis and demonstration of the data in a geospatial format. So we'll discuss some of that in a little bit related to risk assessments and community risk reduction. And then in 2016, just prior to leaving to come to this position, uh, I was given the role of community risk reduction chief which honestly, you know, if you'd have told me 27 years ago that I'd been chief of community risk reduction, I probably would have laughed at you, but uh, the team there was able to do some amazing work with geospatial-based risk assessments 
uh, that focused our reduction efforts on those in need. So we had a significant number of fire deaths over a short period of time, and we were able to do a risk analysis based on our GIS data to really pinpoint where we needed to provide services for the populations at risk. So my point is I'm not trying to impress you with this information, but I was never the GIS guy, but now I'm a GIS guy. I truly believe in the technology, and I'm happy to be here to support fire departments across the nation to leverage GIS for their missions. Also, quick note, today is GIS Day, so happy GIS Day. Um, and this day provides a forum for GIS users to demonstrate real-world applications and make a difference in our communities. Um, GISday.com has multiple resources and also events that may be you know, in your neighborhood. Uh, this is the 18th annual GIS Day. The first one took place in 1999, and uh, our company president, Jack Dagerman, credits actually Ralph Nader with uh, proposing this concept of GIS Day. And he considered it an initiative for people to learn about geography and uses of GIS. And Jack wanted GIS to be a grassroots or GIS day to be a grassroots effort to open the technology to everyone. And I think that that's been successful and, and these efforts have paid off when we look at the expansion or the implementation of, of web GIS. And a lot of what we're gonna to discuss today is the capabilities that web GIS provides. So when we look at you know AGOL, ArcGIS Online, or the ability to access GIS technologies in the cloud, uh, it's incredibly powerful. We really turned the corner on putting the technology you know, into the street, into the field, where an average user, and I consider myself a below average user, where the average user can access this technology to uh, complete your miss mission and, and really put the, hand, uh, put the technology in the hands of, of the boots on the ground. Um, you know, our, our complexity in response evolves every day. There are you know, more demands on our agencies, agent population, increasing severity of weather events that we have to respond to, and our, our role is changing as we try to keep our communities livable. And I'll, I'll paraphrase a good friend of mine at, at iChief, Chief Jeff, Jeff Doolin. The health of a community depends on the effective operation of its public safety agencies, and it really does. And web GIS can improve that effectiveness and add efficiencies to your day-to-day -day operations. So issues like natural disasters, uh, wildland urban interface, mental illness and the opioid crisis, I mean, they tax our resources every day. And those responders that might be online, you understand that, that the work's not getting any lighter. So it's a heavier lift every day. And these emerging threats strain our resources and force us to find new methods to reduce the risk and, and manage these risks with limited resources. So talking about community risk redu reduction is perfect in that we can use these technologies to, to provide a comprehensive community risk reduction program to reduce the workload and reduce the actual impact on the community. So we can't just continue to throw more personnel and more apparatus and more fire stations at a problem. We, we, we don't have the bandwidth to do that. With the increasing call load, increasing workload and reducing budgets, it's just not a possibility. So you look at the mental health and opioid crisis alone, tax and EMS systems. GIS can help you assess these problems and, and focus solutions that reduce the impact, not only on the citizens in the community, but on your first responders day to day. So if you see the slide there, I'll, I'll just point out a couple of things real quick. Um, supporting workflows, obviously, providing those assessments, risk assessments, but the, the important one there to me is, is ensuring mission critical applications can scale. And I'll give you an example, is that, you know, if you have an organization and your GIS is run on local servers and you start to do public information or outreach in the public and you suddenly have an influx of interest, and you get millions of hits on a, on a website or map in your local servers, sometimes those don't hold up. But in a cloud-based system like WebGIS, you can scale it, you can scale those services to be able to take, take that influx of business, that influx of interest, and still communicate the critical data related to your response or to your CR program, or whatever the, the case may be. So incredible um, technology, incredible capabilities provided with WebGIS. So WebGIS, integrates all data and places incredible analytical resource management and data collection tools in the hands of the frontline fire and EMS service provider. It's no longer necessary to completely rely on a GIS specialist, you know, back in the planning office or in the situation unit in the command post to complete a mission, although you still need that, obviously. You still need that GIS specialist. Um, but more and more, some of the responsibilities and some of the task level work can be moved to the field personnel to provide for real-time data collection and live mapping that allows you to make better decisions. And one of the most common issues and why I'm excited to have this position with Esri, um, and we see it throughout public safety, particularly fire and EMS, is that fire leadership simply don't know what their capabilities are. I mean, a majority of local and state government agencies 
have this capability, have this software, have this infrastructure. And the leaders office just don't know what questions to ask. I can tell you, once I understood exactly what our capabilities were back in Henrico County, uh, it was always, almost enough to make you mad in that I didn't know what to ask for as a, as a fire service leader. And our GS um, department didn't know what to, what to provide because they don't, they, they're, you know, they had an educational issue as well, just like I did. Um, but web GIS allows the average user in the fire station or in a command post or on the ground to plan for a special event to do pre-plans. It allows a command officer to maintain personnel accountability. It increases the safety of responders through personnel accountability, manages resources with real-time information, and allows for the efficient deployment of resources to, de to perform damage assessment or recovery operations and with real-time data collection. And I'll give you a great example of that um, for response and for damage assessment. Um, we partnered with international fire chiefs during Hurricane Harvey and Irma and were able to use field applications and real-time mapping to deploy resources that were responding on EMAC requests. So they were, so they were coming into Florida for Irma. These folks are showing up, don't know where they're operating, don't know the community, don't understand the road network or any of those issues. And we were able to train them while they're in route. I mean, we literally had use our teams on the phone, downloading apps and on the phone, getting instructions on how to run the apps and able to go into the field and do real time data collection on the, on the wide area searches and the rescues. And, and all the time in the EOC and in the coordination centers and operation centers, the command staff were able to see that that data pop up as soon as they recorded it. And even when areas they didn't have connectivity, those, those apps will work. And then as soon as they get connectivity again, again, the data is immediately translated to the map and communicated to all the stakeholders. So incredibly uh, powerful and incredibly efficient method to respond um, to significant events. Also to, and we'll talk about implementing some programs for solutions related to community risk reduction in that same model. So apps are bringing the power of GS to everybody, frontline staff and command staff. And now basically your first responders are becoming human sensors. You can collect whatever data you wish um, at any location and then communicate that data to anyone that needs it. So regardless of the agency, uh, what jurisdiction they're from or what discipline they're working in, you can decide who gets that data, when they get it, and how they view it. So with security built in, you may have some data that law enforcement wants to see, but you don't want to communicate, say, to you know a hospital system or a health system or something of that nature. So very flexible in the way we communicate data. And again, no, no jurisdictional boundaries on how we communicate. It's a common platform that we can use to, to simply communicate massive, massive amount of data to anyone you want. It's applicable for preparedness, mitigation, response, and recovery. And it really helps meet the expectations of the public for public information. Um, and one of the evacuation maps produced for Harvey, the one day hits for the evacuation map out of the um, state of Texas EOC was 29 million. So it reached out to 29 million different views on the website of the, uh, the Texas state EOC for the evacuation information. So when you communicate that kind of information to the public, the citizens have the ability to take action and protect their own lives and their own property. And then you can also engage in two-way conversations or two-way communication with them related to data collection and have them crowdsource damage assessment data. So you can have pictures geolocated where they took the picture um, submitted to your uh, to, to your web GIS and then obviously can focus recovery efforts or re focus your damage assessment on where you see uh, the, that crowdsourcing information coming from. So. Um, it simplifies, simplifies working with all types of data, so it's not just a map. And it also allows anybody with access to a browser on any device can leverage the GIS to manage their resources. Technology provides a platform that can be communicated across agencies, localities, and all levels of government. Uh, it does not matter what radio system you use, doesn't matter what software you're using, doesn't matter um, where you are, as long as you have connectivity, you can access the WebGIS platform and share it with anyone you wish. And I'll give one more war story example related to that issue is we, we had a marina fire almost a, a year ago today, I guess about 11 months ago today. Um, and it was significant to us because our brand new fire boat was sitting in the marina that was on fire. So we lost our, our $700,000 fire boat. But if you think about the response to a significant event like that, you know, of course it doesn't start right away with GIS mapping. You're still starting that, that response with a grease pencil in the hood of the battalion car. But as soon as we had incident management team personnel on the ground, we were able to make maps that are then communicated to agencies that are responding well outside of our area. So we had the marina laid out you know, through our um, real estate layer and imagery, but we could show where the fire was, we could show where the hazardous material release was and how far it was downstream, and we could show the perimeter of our booming efforts. And then we were able to share that immediately 
with our state environmental quality agencies, our state emergency management agencies, uh, federal EPA, and the Coast Guard. So those folks, while they're en route, can get a real-time picture of what's happening at your incident. So incredibly powerful on being able to work with all types of data and, and broadcast it to or communicate it to any agency you wish. So but what are we concentrating on today? GIS for reducing risk in the community. So we're gonna talk about what is CRR, and I'll reference now Vision 2020, an incredible organization that is really the grassroots effort for the expanding community risk, risk reduction program in this country. Most of the information you see specific to community risk reduction is from Vision 2020. So we'll provide some links to their resources at the end. Um, and I encourage you to, to investigate that if you're not familiar with community risk reduction. We're gonna focus a lot on risk assessment and leveraging GIS for that risk assessment and then discuss what resources are available to implement solutions in your community. So community risk reduction coordinates emergency operations and prevention and mitigation efforts across the community at the fire station level. So we have to have involvement from field personnel and it's critical for uh, data collection in the field. And GIS can provide solutions to lessen the impact on the day-to-day -day activities of frontline personnel. So if you can reduce the paperwork, if you can reduce unnecessary visits to parts of the community that don't need assistance, you reduce the workload on the frontline personnel and the impact that it has on them. But the benefits of a comprehensive CR program include bettering the health of the community, improving firefighter safety, and it can actually impact your accreditation process. So if you're from a, an agency that's in the accreditation process or is accredited, a lot of these risk assessment processes duplicate or, or overlap in, in that process as well. So we also have to be able to identify new and emerging hazards, and these risk assessments do that. We need to be able to provide data and results to influence our leadership, particularly the budgetary process and elected officials. We need to be able to track changing demographics of our community and understand how that impacts our risk reduction efforts and also our response issues. Um, and we have to be able to identify the underserved populations in our community. So CR is not limited to, to fire prevention. I mean, it certainly started there and it's the growth of that, but the process can be a, applied to any risk you can identify. Uh, any risk that you can collect data on, you can impact and reduce. And consider, you know, we do an assessment for risk of fires occurring in single family dwellings. We do that because we can collect data and we can spatially analyze where these are occurring and why they're occurring. But think about, you could do that with any kind of data you can collect. So could you pull CAD data on a specific uh, medical problem, right? Fall prevention. You can certainly map that. You can certainly analyze that. and and understand where to focus efforts on your fall prevention education. So any health problem, the data is available. The CRR process allows you to focus the reductions efforts and you know on the population in need specifically, and not just do a broad scope, community-wide um, program unless you, you feel it's necessary. But you know the fire service exists not only to respond to emergencies, but to prevent or mitigate mitigate the impact of incidents within their communities. So CRR provides a focused approach to reducing those specific risks. And in addition, a CR program involving community partners and firefighters and other staff uh, can change your organizational culture within the fire service and really have a good impact on your community. So we talk about the process. What is the CRR planning cycle? And you'll see this mimics a lot of the cycles we use throughout public safety. Uh, this one is provided by Vision 2020. And again, we'll give you access or give you links to get these resources. Um, it's an ongoing process that creates a living document and it continually assesses the community, continually prioritizes the risks, and helps you implement reduction activities and then evaluate the results or the impact of those activities. And it provides a more focused approach to reducing specific risks, again, instead of not using your resources efficiently to um, impact the, the community at need. So at this point, we got our first poll question, and I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff. Great, thanks, Mike. Yeah, so throughout the course of the webinar, we wanted to share uh, several different poll questions with you to get some input from you on on uh, how you might be leveraging with inside this, your community. So if you can please help us here and answer this first question here, what level of community risk reduction does your agency employ? So you just hit a checkbox here, excuse me, the radio button, and just pick one of these. So the first one, we do not have a community risk reduction program. Second, my agency performs basic fire prevention activities. And third, we have a comprehensive risk reduction program. And from well, hearing from Mike earlier, it sounds like that's definitely what they have there in, in Rico County. But if you can please uh, help us out and, and fill out this quick first poll, we'll um, uh, 
get a better sense of the of the audience today and what type of uh, um, community risk reduction program you have in your jurisdiction. So we'll give that just a, another minute here and let people uh, s select their answers. Great. Um, thanks. Well, Brenda, if you can close the poll now, we'll look look at our results. So yeah, 21% said we do not have a community risk reduction program. So glad you're here today to learn more. 50% said my agency performs basic fire prevention activities. And 29% of you uh, filled out and indicated that you have a comprehensive risk reduction program in, in your community. One. And hopefully we can uh, teach you something and learn a little bit more today. So that's that's the results of the first poll there, Mike. So So back to you to continue on. Excellent, excellent. Good mix of results there. So, um, so let's dive into the risk assessment. I mean, this, the process begins with this risk assessment, and we can uh, assess risks that are man-made, naturally occurring, include preventable injuries, controllable health risks you know, like obesity and diabetes, uh, severe weather flooding, and less common risks including, you know, terrorism, MCIs, mass casualty incidents, uh, and then the impact of hurricanes, earthquakes, and major natural disasters, all the way up to including uh, major hazardous material releases. The assessment identifies risks in the given community and allows public safety agencies to prioritize those risks. And the initial step in the preparedness allows for mitigation efforts, planning, and the ability to make data-driven decisions to deploy resources. Again, identify what parts of the community you need to concentrate on as you um, implement your community risk reduction efforts. So the steps for the risk assessment are acquire data, develop a community profile, identify, identify causal factors, and then identify target hazards. So what data is available for analysis? Um, we'll see that, we're gonna to try to see, there we go. Um, you know, there are multiple, multiple sources for your data, and these are just a few very broad scope as an example, but obviously fire department incident data, inverse data, um, your CAD or public safety answering point data uh, is, is, is good to identify what risks are impacting or what hazards are impacting your community. Your emergency management office can give you disaster related data and, and probably have done community wide or even region wide risk assessments related to that. Centers for disease control and, and more and more and more. Um, we gather data to inquire about what is occurring within our community. So it's used to identify current risks and trends based on historical information. And there'll be a large number of, of resources where you can get the data to identify current and potential risks. GIS provides the ability to take all this data and a visual perspective that you can easily communicate the risk within a community and allows public safety officials to analyze multiple data sets at the same time where you can overlay them to determine how the risks will impact the citizens. And we'll, we'll try to, or we will give you a couple of good examples of that. Um, but so, you know, when you get, say, we're gonna look at CAD data first, and this is a typical output from a records management system for your inference, your, your fire reporting data. And that gives you a lot of good information, no doubt about it. I mean, it's telling us, you know, we had, we had a bunch of fires and, and we had a significant amount of property loss. Um, and you can go through and, and look at this as an individual data set and, and identify trends, you know, how many were in single family dwellings and how many were in multifamily dwellings. But you can also overlay this with additional data from your risk assessment or from your, from your GIS data and you can map it out. And this is a very rudimentary map, um, done with the, the inference data, but you can see, you can start to see patterns, you can start to see concentrations based on uh, incident type and then dollar loss and then what kind of facility it is or what kind of um, occupancy it is. And this is, again, you can filter it any way you want. We just picked incident type for this one, one um, demonstration, or this one evaluation. But you can go through and overlay that on a map and understand that some communities may have a different, um, different issue. So you may have some areas due to residential density of multifamily dwellings, you may have a multifamily problem and you can see it on the map and then focus efforts maybe at the rental company level or the, the management company level instead of trying to go door to door and impact all those apartment complexes in a high density area. So again, you can contain all that data, but it provides a visual by type of fire, occupancy type and location. And we can easily identify areas of community that have concentrated risk. So after collecting the data and developing a risk on responses and, and, and that information, we will need to develop a community profile. And this obviously, we know has um, additional risk indicators. When we look at age, um, there's a correlation between income and, and number of incidents. And certainly excellent uh, part of our risk assessment is that last one is using that tax parcel to develop, you know, what are our housing types? How old is our housing stock? And where are our areas of higher density? Uh, if necessary to identify those factors, 
contributing to the severity of the hazards and then identifying those populations that are at the, the greatest risk. And then additional causal factors um, due to the population specifically, you know, social and cultural influences, economic factors, uh, age groups, the very old, the very young, disability, those living in poverty, and then populations that speak little or no English. And an excellent uh, method to use or, or an excellent application to use is uh, Esri's tapestry segmentation. It's very, very um, comprehensive. It helps you understand your customer's lifestyle choices, you know, what they buy and how they spend their free time, which may not sound like it makes a big difference, but in certain applications it can. But it also brings in those demographic, you know, age issues, um, you know, immigration issues and those, and those, you know, English is a second language, but it looks at 67 unique segments at the neighborhood level. Um, it's, you can get insights on, and you can identify your community members in underserved markets, and you can get a higher um, response rate, as I say, a higher effectiveness on your response, depending on what the, the risk is, based on targeting those populations that, that need the help that are at the most risk. Uh, a good example is this, we had, uh, um, uh, outbreak of measles and covered a couple of state area and the state health folks were trying to figure out how to target public information and where to set up inoculation centers um, and then you know what, what was the best media for outreach and so they were able to use this tapestry segmentation to look at you know what areas need what kind of public information obviously the inoculation was was aimed at, at um, children so they were able to identify what neighborhoods they needed to set up the inoculation centers but also on the public information side and the media side you know, if, if it's an older age group, you might want to do some public safety announcements during Wheel of Fortune, right? But if it's a younger group, then maybe social media is a better answer to get that information out. And so I showed this map here, and, and, and Jeff will have some additional information on tapestry. Um, it, this one's a little bit older, but what was um, interesting to me on this was that they overlaid the first in fire districts in the tapestry segmentation. So again, we can bring in any kind of data you wish to do this analysis. So now, not only do you have this tapestry information by neighborhood, but you can look at it by fire district. And so very good for at the fire station level, understanding what your risk is um, within those, those boundaries or whatever data layer you wishes, wish to include. So another good example was considering evacuation for an approaching hurricane and emergency management agency was worried about the, those in the, um, in the storm surge area and what kind of evacuation needs would they have. So if you look at the kind of demographic profiles available and tapestry, you know, you know that in certain segments, they're going to be um, possibly unable to drive, maybe have some ambulatory issues. They're probably going to be on prescription medication. So if we shelter them, that's going to impact our shelters. You know, they're going to have pets they want to bring with them. So issues like that can be filtered out of this tapestry segmentation to help improve your response and help improve, improve your deployment of, of community risk reduction solutions. So uh, a very interesting, um, a very interesting tool. And again, Jeff will speak, speak to it a little bit more later. So. Um, next on it, on our uh, uh, planning process is the risk assessment. I'm sorry, is identifying target hazards. And most of you are probably familiar with this. Um, there are several models out there you can look at for, um, for prioritizing your risk related to target hazards. They can include assembly occupancies, educational facilities, healthcare, and you see the list there. Uh, FEMA defines these as facilities either in the public or private sector that provide essential products and services for the general public, necessary to preserve the welfare or quality of life or fulfill important public safety or emergency response or disaster and recovery functions. So we can do a vulnerability assessment based on these structures. So structures with low vulnerability may be fire resistive or non-combustible related to their fire risk. Uh, moderate structures could be a moderate, moderately vulnerable structures could be those of you know ordinary construction. Um, high vulnerability would be wood frame, uh, heavy timber, and then very high vulnerability could be combustible materials that have shared walls and attics with other structures, and then you can add to that in, um, special risks such as uh, technological or hazmat hazards that are involved. And occupancy types assigned to higher score are considered more critical than those with a lower score, obviously. Uh, but we can also look at some basic concepts that you can, or basic information that you can get out of your parcel layer, and that can be um, the expected number of occupants and what's the life safety risk, what type of building, uh, building construction, we can add the impact, including economic to the community. You know, how many stories is the building? Does it have automatic fire suppression detection systems, number of fire hydrants nearby, and uh, level of hazard related to the building and the occupancy type. Uh, the map here is an example of a map depicting various locations of target hazards based on defined criteria and using that scoring system. 
in this case is color co coded in accordance with their particular score, making it easier to identify, you know, the highest risk structures or highest risk target hazards. You could also just generate a map with the highest level of risk, which is what we've done in the past in my personal experience. But what's interesting is that Esri, we have a, a target hazard assessment tool available to you and that uses tax parcel data from the assessor's office as input into the analysis. So, you know, a lot of localities go out and use pre-planning, use company level to visit these structures and do an assessment. And that's still needed. I mean, we're still doing pre-plans. We're still doing life safety assessments at these structures, but certainly a good way to do a community-wide target hazard identification program is to use our target hazard assessment tool, because you can do that without investing the time to put boots on the ground to look at every structure. And you can use the tool to prioritize, you know, which, which facilities are true, the highest level of target hazard within your community. And the tax parcel information includes things like, you know, how big is the property, the use description or occupancy type, what's the building area, square footage, number of floors, uh, what's it worth, what's the assessed value. That should certainly be a consideration when we talk about dollar loss and community risk reduction. Uh, and there are all these attributes you use to determine uh, the following hazard criteria, and that is life safety, what are the fire flow requirements, what's the economic impact if we were to lose that structure or those jobs, and then building height and building area. And Interesting to note that the tax parcel, the real estate parcel data layer that most localities have or all localities have um, includes a, a lot of additional information that we're not using as far as public safety goes. I mean, it, it's, it'll tell you what kind of HVAC system or what kind of heating system they have. Sometimes you'll be able to identify what kind of roof structure. Uh, does it have a basement? Recently had a conversation with a guy from Tennessee, with a firefighter from Tennessee, and he was using tax parcel information to uh, or going to use tax parcel information to identify where residential elevators were, because they had an incident where they almost had a, a firefighter injury in a, in a structure with a residential elevator. Obviously not in the same um, business inspection list that would be in a, in a commercial structure. So that was, that was a pretty interesting use of that tax parcel layer and that data to, to prevent firefighter injury. Um, and if, if you need specific site data not available through that tax parcel, you can be collected in the field like we've always done, but we can also use a collector application like um, Esri's Collector or Esri Survey 123 to on a mobile device. So there's no paperwork, nobody's dealing in, emailing anybody, nobody's got to submit paperwork to the office to have it put into a map or put onto some kind of um, visual display. To, with the mobile device, whether it's a handheld you know, mobile phone or it's a Windows 10 environment on a mobile data computer, you can immediately upload the data as you're standing at the site so it can be used for further assessment and access can be provided to anybody else in your agency or anybody for that matter. Um, to, to use that information for pre-planning issues or risk assessments or whatever the case may be. So now we have our next poll question and I'll turn it back over to Jeff. Great, thanks Mike. So then our next poll question here is what type of risk assessment is your agency currently performing? So again, please help us out by selecting one of the radio buttons here. The first answer, my agency is not currently performing a risk analysis. Second, fire district or geographic area-based risk assessment. Or third, risk assessment based on each address point. So um, our, our second poll question here, just use the radio buttons to select one of the answers here. And we'll give you just another minute to uh, complete that task. Great. Uh, th thanks, everyone. Brenda, if you can go ahead and show the results here. And our poll results here, 48% said my agency is not con uh, currently performing risk analysis. 29% said fire district or geographic area-based risk assessment. And 23% responded back risk assessment based on each address point. So th thanks, everyone, for filling out our, our second poll here. And with that, Brenda, you can close this out and, and turn it back over to Mike to continue on. Thank you, Jeff. And, th and the risk assessment by address point is what I wanted to concentrate on. Our, our GIS office in Henrico was able to assist us through one of our accreditation cycles uh, about five years ago. Um, and our fire planning office working with them directly, we're, we're able to take that tax data, tax parcel data, uh, and do an assessment on, on each individual address point. And while this certainly impacts our community risk reduction, it completely changed the way we deploy resources day to day and dispatch for, for fire calls or other types of calls in our community. Um, like a lot of fire departments, we, we, based on, we based our response on occupancy type only. So a house was a house and a commercial structure was a commercial structure. So if you see the, the photos there, you know, a 5,000 square foot McMansion was getting the same resources, regardless of water supply capability, that the 800 foot bungalow was getting. 
and you know even worse in my opinion the the 7-eleven the the six or seven thousand square foot 7-eleven or convenience store was getting the same dispatch that the big box store and obviously the risk is not the same when you respond to these occupancies and the job task analysis proved that we weren't sending enough uh resources to each to each um occupancy type based on the size and risk and hazards that were present so our GS office was able to provide us with um, a rating, and you can see on the left there how they basically rated each individual address point throughout our community. So, you know, how far is it from the water supply? So, you know, back in the day, you always either had to know where your hydrant system ended if you were in an urban slash rural community, um, or you had to make sure that somebody had a map book open to know when to call for extra resources to help your water supply. Well, now because of the use of our parcel layer data and our, I'm sorry, our water infrastructure data, data we could simply have that on dispatch. So the dispatcher, you know, when they when they push the button to dispatch, we know if it's in a, a rural water supply area or um, a, a supply area. So we, whether we have hydrants or not. And then square footage. So if it's over a certain square footage, you know, we dispatch more to it. The building height, four stories and more, um, elevated it to a different hazard level. And then use group, obviously, whether you're going from, you know, a hospital or, or school or something of that nature down to a single family dwelling. And then what was incredibly effective was our GS folks were able to work out with our CAD system where they uploaded all these occupancies once a month, I believe it is, might be every other week. Um, but in other words, so all new occupancies were included in this. And so the dispatchers, when they take the 911 call, once they verify the location, all this information is then dumped into the CAD and that recipe is automatic. So in milliseconds, it determines, you know, whether it's a, it's a high hazard or special hazard um, uh, commercial occupancy, or if it's a single family dwelling in a rural setting or a single family dwelling in a hydrant area, uh, just incredible uh, efficiency on the way we deploy our resources. So as an example, um, in 2012, we would have dispatched uh, three engines and two ladder trucks to that 7-Eleven on the bottom left. And in 2012, we would have dispatched three engines and two ladder trucks to the Home Depot shopping mall on the right. But now we'll send, based on the job task analysis, for a high hazard, so if you're thinking about a high-rise structure, a hospital, or something of that nature, we're actually dispatching five engines and three special services, multiple command officers, and ambulances, based on the fact that we can identify that as a high or as a special hazard occupancy on the 911 call as soon as the dispatcher verifies the location, and then we performed a job task analysis to match the hazard with the response. So we obviously use this information as well during our risk assessment uh, for community risk reduction, and I'll show you a couple of models where. We've done something similar for other programs, reaching out to the community. Here's a good example of um, analyzing call type. So, you know, you know what your most common cause of fire is in your in your community, and you know, you know what most common structure is in your community. But are you looking at it based on on geospatial data? So this is from the city of Bolton in Washington State, and they took a look at um, their wildland urban interface. And when they first did the analysis, they only did um, they only looked at wildland interface fires. But when they came back and pulled additional data, they looked at any kind of, of um, outside of the structure fire, so vegetation, you know, and infers you classify it multiple ways. So they're able to pull all that data together and then overlay it on their community map, on their um, on their map. And so by looking at this map, you can see where their wildland urban interface problem is. And it just so happens that's an area that's a high density of single single and multifamily dwellings. But this map allows you to do, I mean, several things. One, you can you can focus your public education and your fuel management operations in that area of your locality. So you're not wasting time somewhere else. You can also um, put resources, deploy resources in that area that are specific to that type of response. So, you know, your brush trucks and those and the wildland kind of equipment. So very effective in the way to visualize and make good data driven decisions based on the data you collect and then how you present it spatially. So a couple other. Um, Good uses of, of GIS data and um, developing service areas and determining which, where, where your risk is. Uh, you'll see on the left there, that's uh, Wilson, North Carolina, and they did a drive time analysis uh, from their fire station locations to determine where their gaps were. And I'll, and I'll give you another good example of WebGIS. Now, I mean, a, a couple of years ago, this would take a GIS specialist somewhere in an office running this in, on, on a desktop to give you this kind of information. Now you can develop this kind of information at the fire station level and not only do a drive time analysis based on your road network but now you can easily add real-time traffic data and even historical traffic data to determine look you know what's our four minute um, response area at five o'clock in the evening or six o'clock in the evening versus five o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the morning so incredibly powerful on, on how we deploy resources and, and where our resources need to be 
In the bottom right, you'll see one from, from back home there in Henrico County. Um, that's a drive time analysis for special services. And you can see some gaps there in our five, 10 and 15 minute that would help determine where to deploy resources. And then the top right is a drive time analysis. You'll see it outlined in the blue, but also an overlay of a response time analysis. So where are your gaps in response times? And then that, that drive time analysis in that location is for a proposed fire station. So if you're proposing a new fire station, you can show where your gaps are in response and where your greatest risk is, and then actually overlay, hey, look, if we put a fire station and engine company and an ambulance in this location, obviously it covers that area of highest risk or the biggest, um, biggest gap in response times. That's a powerful tool to take to your elected officials and be able to, to convince them of what the need is based on real data and based on, on, on good data to make an informed decision. All right, and our last poll question's coming up. So I'll turn it over to Jeff. Great. Thanks, Mike. Yes, and so yeah, thanks everyone for your for your continued answers. The next poll question here is what is is what resources your department currently using to perform GIS based analysis? So basically, who's who's helping you do the GIS analysis for your department? Um, first first answer there is we are not currently performing GIS based analysis. Second, we have internal personnel that provides you know GIS you know services. This could be from uh, IT department within your agency. Or third, we use an outside agency your department to perform our GIS services. So in here, we're just trying to get a sense of, of who's providing uh, the, the help to conduct you know, GIS analysis with inside uh, your department. So if you can uh, just select one of the radio buttons here for our last and final poll, I'll give it you just another minute and we'll uh, go ahead and close that out, Brenda, and we'll look at the, our, our results. Okay, great. 25% uh, said we are current, not currently performing GIS-based analysis. 68% uh, six, said we have internal personnel that provides that service. And 7% said we use an outside agency or department to provide that uh, GIS service. So there, there's your answers, Mike, for the final uh, poll, and we'll uh, turn it back over to you to, to continue on. Wow, that's, that's an incredible. That's an excellent response. Obviously, um, you know, the, the preference of, of fire service leadership and probably, I don't want to speak for too many, but probably the preference of your GIS manager and the IT office would be to have those capabilities within the fire department. I know with the workload um, and, and the difficulty in priority, prioritizing projects, it, it certainly is nice to have somebody inside the fire department being able to do at least some of these um, analysis and some of these projects. So that's great, great response. So <clears throat> we're going to look at how we engage, I'm sorry, how we provide some of these solutions to the community. So we've done our community risk uh, assessment. We've done a risk assessment. Now we say we've identified some risks, and I'm going to show you a couple of real ones, um, and then um, Jeff will come through with some some solutions too that you can implement relatively easy. But um, in Henrico County, we had a number of fire deaths in a short period of time. It was six in about 45 days, which would, I'd never experienced in my career. Uh, all single-family dwellings, and there were several, you know, without working smoke alarms. So the the direction from the fire chief was, you know, we have to do something about prevention and also the smoke alarm issue within our community because we obviously have one. And so the map you see there is a risk assessment that was done on single family dwellings that identified which one of our, um, which individual addresses in our community were likely to need the most help with prevention, education, and also a smoke alarm install. So uh, we engaged about 30 county agencies, I mean 30 agencies inside and outside of our county Obviously, GIS, our county GIS office was a, a lead agency, um, but any any agency we felt like had outreach to the community and could provide us information or provide us contact with our at-risk population, we brought into this into this project. So, police department, sheriff's department, social services, child protective services, the list goes on and on. Even outside agencies, you know, Red Cross, uh, Meals on Wheels, anybody we felt like could be inside of a structure and see that these folks needed some kind of protection or they had some risk we engage to, to implement this program. But then um, our fire planning office and our GIS office sat down and did a risk analysis, which was, uh, in my opinion, pretty pretty incredible. Oh, let me see if I can get the right slide there. Here we go. So what they did using that tax parcel data was they tried to identify um, homes that we felt like were in the most need for, for a smoke alarm install and then public educational and fire prevention. Now we're only installing 10 year tamper proof smoke alarms from here on out. So the, the fire department doesn't even go out and change batteries anymore. If you have a problem with your smoke alarm, you're getting a 10 year sealed smoke alarm so that then we can start tracking you and come back in nine years and reinstall a, a smoke alarm that you know has to be re replaced every 10 years. But they took the tax parcel data 
Uh, we identified household income less than $45,000 annually. Um, and then any structure that was built before 1980, and then any structure that had a sale date before 1990, thinking that they probably hadn't had the smoke alarms replaced in, in over 10 years. Um, and then we added or could add some CAD data as well. So say you had three falls in 12 months, then that to me, you know, or that was an uh, indication you might be at risk, right? Some health problems or ambulatory problems. So indicated you may need some education or assistance. And then one of the unique things they did um, was our GIS office working with our fire planning folks figured out how to identify rental property because we consider rental property with a transient population maybe a little bit more at risk than um, a homeowner occupied structure. So what they were able to do was take real estate parcel layer data, identify the, the owner. So who, who owns that home? And then they took water billing information. So who pays the water bill? And if the name on the on the ownership, the name on the on the real estate layer didn't match the name on the water bill, then we just assumed that somebody else was living in the house and it was a rental. Now, obviously, that's not going to be 100 percent, but I thought that was an incredibly um, ingenious way to, to identify what rental properties and single family dwellings were, were throughout the county. So we initially came up with a list of 7000 at, at risk um, households out of about, I want to say, 60 or 70,000 occupancies. And our aim was to hit those 7,000 in the first year and then keep going down the list and obviously doing another risk assessment every year, but keep going down the list for basically a nine year cycle. And then in nine years, we'd start all over and start replacing those 10 year old um, smoke alarms that we had, that we had installed at the beginning of the program. But so here are some of the results and it may be hard to read, but I want you to look at the box at the bottom left. So that's a, a risk assessment validity study uh, that our analysts did in, the, in, in fire planning. But if you look at that, that those are the addresses that were visited based on the risk assessment I just talked about. And out of every home that we made contact, out of every time of the homes that answered the doorbell, three quarters, 75 percent of them needed a smoke alarm. So to me, that's incredible. That That's an excellent example of being able to focus your resources on the population that needs. So um, the personnel doing doing the visits, the, the um, public education visits and smoke alarm installs, they didn't do a whole neighborhood. They had a map that showed them where exactly they needed to go to identify or to these identified at risk occupancies and then had a workflow established where they did some quick data collection in the field on an MDC on a mobile data computer. So there's no paperwork or anything of that nature. And then that provides us analytics on the back end. So we know who's been visited, you know, what the interaction was. Did we install a smoke alarm? Then we'll be able to look at this data over the years to determine how effective the how effective the uh, the program is. So just again, incredibly powerful way to use geospatial data to save lives and prevent incidents from occurring in your in your locality. So I want to talk a moment about <clears throat> um, being able to deploy resources with these mobile applications we mentioned at the beginning and the web GIS based. So what we're looking at here is an application on the left called Workforce. And then the uh, mobile-based application on the right, which can also run in the Windows 10 environment, is called Survey123. Now, we put this together as a beta. Um, and again, it's, it's very intuitive, very simple to use. And I'll be honest with you, I put this together in, in you know, an hour or two um, sitting, at, sitting at my desk. So if I can do it, you know, anybody can do it. But the interesting thing is with Workforce is it's a dispatch system. So you can, whatever um, data layer you want to pull in, to identify where the work is. So as an example, this map on our left, on the left is the uh, target hazard map. So you see the red and the blue, different varying levels of risk, but those are our target hazards. And we had so many commercial structures in the county that our company level inspection process just couldn't keep up. So there's no way we we're gonna inspect all the structures at the, with our company level inspections. So the fire planning office decided that, look, we're gonna modify um, our, commercial, our, our company level business inspections. We're gonna rename it to commercial hazard assessment and we're only gonna do the highest risk structures in our community. So that reduced the number of visits they were required to do every year by thousands. And we also developed um, a specific form on the web app, on, on Survey123, that only, co that only collected information we really wanted. So you, you get, you know, who did, the, who did the visit, but it was really about the life safety of the occupants and then the life safety of the firefighters. So you can indicate if there's life safety hazards and then it'll notify the fire marshal's office to come by and do a real business inspection, an actual business inspection. But it also indicates, you know, or the, one of the questions is, does the pre-plan need to be updated? And so that kind of information is collected on each address. And back to the workforce on the left. So somebody at a fire district level, you know, so if you've got a fire, a fire captain in charge of a first-end district, 
they can actually go in and make assignments on that map. So you can do a batch assignment where you draw um, a polygon or a buffer around a certain number of structures, and you can assign those structures uh, to a user. And whether it's, you know, Engine 1 B-Shift or an individual user, Firefighter Smith, it would actually pop up on their phone, and they've got a work list on their phone. And then it routes them to the location, gives them mapping to get to the location. They mark when they get on scene by starting their work, and then they mark back in service when they're finished. And then all the time submitting that form on the right uh, while they're while they're doing the site visit. So it allows you to track the work, how long were they there, and it also allows you to see everybody that's in the system, everybody's running this application, you can see them on the map. And so one of the unique deployments of this was we were discussing the recent response to Florida and how we partnered with International Fire Chiefs. Um, they used workforce and survey one, two, three with outside agencies to assess the nursing home issue. And you may have heard you know, in Florida, they had some nursing homes that were flooded and they had some issues. And so the issue was, or the, the, the problem was that on an EMAC request, they had actual fire marshals and responders coming from other states. So you had, you had personnel coming from Louisiana, South Carolina, wherever they came from, obviously didn't know the community and didn't know what they were, where they were going um, to, to do these assessments. So they put their nursing home layer or the nursing home addresses into a layer on the map. They gave all the fire marshal folks survey one, two, three on their phones or, or NBC or whatever they were using. And then they were actually able to assign work to these folks that were from out of state. It would route them to the work. They do the assessment, answer some questions and submit it through survey one, two, three, all the time being tracked from the command post uh, by the folks running workforce. So they could see where they were, you know, see that, make sure they weren't going in the hazard zones, things of that nature. But the data was coming back real time. So you're sitting in an emergency operations center or coordination center somewhere and you're watching these dots pop up on a map that's providing you whatever information you put on that form and you can make real time or you can make decisions based on real time information. You know, what what nursing homes have to be moved, where do we have to move them to, things of that nature. So, again, a very um, a very easy to use, very effective application. So essentially workforce is, is a dispatch center and then the survey one, two, three is your your data collection, data database, form based data collection. So incredibly powerful stuff to provide for efficient response and safety of responders while they're in the field. Um, so at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Jeff, and he's going to provide uh, some overview of some possible or uh, overview of some applications you can use for possible solutions in the field. Great, thanks, Mike. So you've, now you've, Mike's kind of taken you through kind of a tour of some of the concepts to apply, you know, GIS to kind of community risk reduction. And I want to spend a few minutes here just talking about some of the, the technical resources that are available to you uh, to, to help out with uh, the, this important, you know, process. So as Mike mentioned earlier, we have the Target Hazard Analysis Solution Template. So this is something you can download from our um, website, you know, free of charge, and it basically walks you through the process of uh, conducting target hazard analysis in your jurisdiction. So again, this is not kind of going door to door with uh, assessing your know, properties in the area. It looks it looks at different factors from a variety of different data sources, including the parcel data that you're able to bring in. Um, it looks at factors like occupancy, building size and height, uh, fire flow, that type of thing. And there's a set of scoring criteria that you can pull together here to essentially pull, you know, create a map like you see here, a thematic map, red, green, yellow, and, and help you kind of focus uh, your your uh, processes and, and areas for uh, further work with inside your jurisdiction. And that um, scoring can take place in a, in a real simple Excel spreadsheet to allow you to have conversation with, you know, fire officials in your, in your jurisdiction to help, you know, kind of tweak what might be, you know, most appropriate for your jurisdiction. So, again, this is a desktop tool that, that's available to you and something you can download from our website and all of these links will be shared um, in an email that we'll send you after this webinar. Another important solution template here is our fire incident maps template. So basically allowing you to take data coming from your CAD or RMS system and start to make basic, you know, online web maps of this data, looking at, you know, uh, uh, symbolizing these things by different types, whether that's by incident type, as you see here, um, look what's the responding company, uh, what's the response time for each of the calls uh, here. So again, it's another way to help you kind of get started in looking at some of the patterns or trends 
uh, based on your incident data that you have coming out of your CAD or, or RMS system. And kind of the advanced step here for this template is to schedule updates using TAS to uh, have this uh, information you know, up, up to date. So again, I just wanted to raise your level of awareness of some of the additional solution templates that may be available to you. Another one is the fire safety surveys, right? So as, as Mike mentioned, if you're going out and doing uh, smoke detector installations, you know, that type of thing, there's a way to, through this template, to track the work that's been done using some of our mobile tools. So in this case, you see a screenshot of collector in the front, um, you know, what may have been traditional paper forms that you may have filled out in the field can now be collected in, in a, a digital environment here using smartphones and then back at some sort of you know central location back in the station back in the, the office you can see the work being done by all the teams in the field so this is just kind of one example of applying our mobile technology to help out with you know situations like these so fire safety surveys is just you know one example these could be assessments of individual structures those that kind of point based address point based uh, assessment that Mike had mentioned uh, earlier but again you know fire safety surveys is, is something to uh, to take a look at and one of the technical resources that's available to you as you're as you're looking to implement your community risk reduction program is also wanted to highlight um, the demographic data that's available. There, there's a great wealth of demographic layers that are available with inside ArcGIS Online. So to go and get there, and with inside your map, just simply go to the Browse the Living Atlas Layers, select the demographics and lifestyle category there, and then you'll see the wealth of demographic information that would be important to help you build your community profile. Age, you know, income, um, the tapestry segmentation that Mike mentioned you know, earlier, just a wealth of demographic uh, variables that are available to you to then help you build out you know, really quickly your community profile with some of the key demographic data that's of interest to you um, and being able to bring that, uh, bring that together and then overlay other uh, data with that such as the uh, the fire station uh, boundaries layer here for the for the first first two areas we can bring in here is in building that with inside a, a story map so you know very quickly given the the wealth of demographic data that's available with inside ArcGIS Online you can quickly build a community profile for your uh, jurisdiction and this may be a great thing to have conversations with others in your in in the department on what else they'd like to see other kind of additional analysis this is a great way to start to build the information information products to have that conversation uh, to help uh, in figuring out better risk reduction strategies within inside your jurisdiction. And as Mike mentioned earlier, another kind of uh, uh, ev evolution of the technology and really the, the power of WebGIS is being able to, to conduct analysis directly on the web without having to have you know desktop software installed or frankly even any data uh, available to you. So w w really what we're kind of showing here is you can conduct drive time analysis right on the web um, and, and in fact and take into account many different factors so in this case here if I'm looking at the, the fire station in the middle of the screen I've went ahead and inputted drive times at four six and eight minutes so those are the different rings of drive time that you see there and as Mike mentioned we can factor in with inside ArcGIS Online uh, tra traffic now that can either be live traffic and what things look like you know today based on current conditions or this can be um, based on historical conditions so obviously traffic is going to be uh, a lot different at 2 a.m. on a Sunday morning versus 5 p.m. on a Friday afternoon and we can help understand the drive times uh, within inside our jurisdiction by leveraging some of the tools here and again this is used you know with directly with some of the the tools that are available to you through through ArcGIS Online so uh, just really quickly here I know we're getting kind of it, it to the end of our time and I want to kind of turn it back over to Mike to answer any kind of last questions but wanted to share with you uh, all today some of the kind of technical resources to complement um, some of the concepts that Mike's laid out previously in the webinar in terms of tools and, and templates that you can use um, to help with your community risk reduction strategy and your, your jurisdiction. So back over to you, Mike, to, to close us out. Thank you, Jeff. And, and one thing I'll add, or one question I'll add here, so we'll take questions from the audience as well. But Jeff, can you, can you advise or will we provide information on where to find these solutions and templates that might be available? 
Yeah, yeah, great question. So the, the place to start is solutions.arcgis.com, and we'll we'll send out the specific links for each of these in the in the uh, post event email. But uh, solutions.arcgis.com is the place to start, and then the fire uh, solution templates are under the local government category. So that's the place to start there. Okay, great. And do we get any questions from the audience we need to address now, or we can? Hey, w w one one quick question before closing out, Mike. Um, obviously, with the Northern California fires on the minds of uh, you know a lot of the people attending today, can you can you talk about how um you incorporate wildland fire risk into your your community risk reduction program? Yeah, there's certainly a lot of resources um, from the national wildland level. Uh, even state forestry agencies can provide data and predictive modeling that you can you can consider and right into your GIS layers and right into your community layers to see how it's impacting your specific community. So there's a lot out there and we can we can provide some of those links as well when we send out the email. Great, yep, that was the only question. Wonderful, all right, so again, if, if anybody's got any additional questions that we may have missed or would like to reach out to me or Jeff, um, there's our contact information that'll be included in the email we send out uh, with the link to the recording and um, some of our References we use today, but I certainly want to point out Vision 2020. Uh, we actually partnered with them in 2013 to help develop some of the, the information for the National Community Risk Reduction Program. But I mean, you can see their website there. And again, these will be included in the uh, in the email uh, that we send out after uh, with the link to the recording as well. But I want to thank everyone for attending and listening in. And please feel free to, to send me an email or give me a call if you got any questions. And be glad to to do anything I can do to help to promote the use of GIS in the fire service. So again, thank you and have a good day.